Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath to each one of you. Uh, before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Kind, dear, loving Heavenly Father, we invite you to be with us this morning. The video we are going to watch, dear Lord, may inspire us uh, to know the validity of the Bible account. So, dear Lord, take charge of this hour and bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. These days I am on to something. I am, I am going to the archaeological discoveries that we find. The Bible is scrutinized more than any other book. The biblical stories are told to be a myth, it never happened. About 63 years ago, I used to believe that before I accepted Jesus as my personal savior. I even challenged the character of Jesus Christ that Jesus never existed. But uh, uh, it's a long story, I don't want to stand and give a witness of how I became a Christian. Uh, but then it changed. Uh, the archaeological discoveries are taking place, hundreds of them. Thousands and millions of dollars have been spent to just to prove that the biblical account is true. We have an archaeological department at Southern University in Tennessee. It's a wonderful department. Dr. Michael Hazel discovered a city, Southern University discovered archaeological discovery, a city that was told never existed, Lackish. We never heard about that. It's not, no record of that city. So uh, we will not have uh, our song service, but we'll straight to go to the, the video and watch. It's, 27 minutes video. I'm going to stop as we come close to our Sabbath school time, and then I may continue next time. So let's watch this video. Seven hundred and one years before the time of Christ, the Assyrian king Sennacherib came down from the north, conquering the cities of Judah, one after another. His ultimate objective was back up there in the Judean hills, the city of Jerusalem, where King Hezekiah prepared for the inevitable siege that he knew was coming. But before Sennacherib could go up there, he had to conquer the formidably defended city of Lachish. During the conquest, his army built this siege ramp all the way up to the top of the walls of Lachish. We know about it from three sources. One, the Bible. Two, King Sennacherib himself decorated his palace with images of the conquest of this city. Finally, archaeologists today come and dig in this archaeological treasure to find out even more information about the momentous events of that time. We're going to meet Dr. Michael Hazel of Southern Adventist University, one of the leaders of the fourth archaeological expedition to Lachish. One of the amazing contributions of the fourth expedition to Lachish is the discovery that we made of the actual size of the site during what we call level two, which is the sixth and seventh centuries BC, the time just before Nebuchadnezzar's final invasion 
This, of course, is the time we think of when we think of Daniel and his friends being carried off into captivity, where we see the destruction of the temple that had stood for almost 400 years, um, where we see the exile taking place and thousands of people going to Babylon at the end of that time period. The site was massively destroyed, we know that. But how extensive was the site? Previous expeditions had concluded that the site maybe was not very extensively occupied during this time. But we've now been able to show that not only was the site occupied during this time with an extensive uh, gate system, we've now also been able to reestablish a fortification line all the way around the site. And we are finding really incredible amounts of material. One of the amazing discoveries that we made just um, last year was that we found a pot, a large vessel filled with iron tools. And on the outside of the pot was a seal impression. And that seal impression named an individual. What is even more fascinating is that a few meters away from where that pot was found, a little dipper juglet was found in the 1960s with 17 seal impressions inside that little dipper juglet. And one of those seal impressions mentions the same individual. It's only found a few meters away. So that raises a question. Are we dealing with a house that we can actually identify the owner of? How the early kingdom of Judah developed has been part of our research goals and design for the last 11 years. And Lachish has just been an amazing site. The second most important city really in Judah after Jerusalem. And we're looking at that city now and, and trying to figure out, going back to those earliest levels of the Iron Age of the early kingdom and seeing how that traces over time. We have a number of scholars in more recent years that have proposed a low chronology that have basically removed any history for Judah prior to the 8th century. That is, the, old, the whole early monarchy period of, of Saul and David and Solomon and Rehoboam have pretty much been removed. They begin with Ahab and they begin with, with the later period of Israelites, his, Israel's history. So we now have been able to show through new scientific work that these periods did exist and that there's a continuity in development uh, of fortifications, of architecture, of writing, of uh, social uh, networking that is taking place, of trade. All of these are significant connections between different sites and within the growth trajectory of what we have in, in this period. And we can connect now, I believe, these, these sites with Jerusalem. I've always been fascinated with history, and so archaeology and history are tied very closely together. But I also grew up as a Christian, and for me, uh, the connections between archaeology and the Bible were always something very real. My father was an Old Testament scholar. My first trip with my dad by myself was to the Middle East when I was 17 years of age. It opened my eyes to a whole new dimension and reality to the biblical world that I'd never experienced before. That was probably the beginning point of me thinking about the future of my work in archaeology and biblical archaeology in particular. The Bible came to life in a way that it had never come to life before. Dr. Hazel's father was a prominent Christian theologian. He believed that the Bible was true. So when Dr. Hazel decided to study archaeology, was he testing his father's belief in the Bible? Or was he trying to prove his belief true? Growing up in a Christian family and a Christian community, it's sometimes difficult in that context to really specify a specific point of when one becomes a Christian. But then when I started college, a lot of bigger questions started emerging that began to challenge some of those foundational decisions that I'd made. And I was studying abroad in Europe for a year. I had an opportunity to go home uh, for Christmas. I made it a matter of prayer 
And I had about three hours to make a decision before my dad called back and came to the conclusion that I needed to stay. There was just a piece about staying that I felt was there. And whenever I felt about going home, it was a lack of peace. That's the best way I can describe it. So I decided to stay. A few weeks later, I learned that the flight that he had me booked on was Pan Am Flight 103 that crashed in Lockerbie, Scotland. And that was a life-changing moment in my life. And I remember for months after that asking why. why. Why did I survive and not take that flight? And, you know, that was a, a real turning point in asking some very big fundamental questions that I had to wrestle with that year. And I went to the Bible and I found in Scripture many of the answers to those questions. And it was an awakening time for me to understand for the first time I needed to really know for myself who I was as a Christian and whether this was something that I was going to buy into. The university that I attended for my undergraduate and for my first master's degree was a Christian university, Andrews University, and it was very influential in, in forming and developing my, my ideas about archaeology, about the Bible, about biblical backgrounds. Um, I had the opportunity to volunteer and work at the Archaeological Museum on campus. I started going on excavations during that time. Uh, every single summer, every opportunity I had, I would go on an excavation project, and sometimes I would go on two. I was on my first excavation project ever in Israel in 1990, and I had been working there with Professor William Deaver, who was the chair of the Near Eastern Studies program at Arizona. And one evening over dinner, Professor Deaver said, I understand you want to go into archaeology in the future. Would you be interested in the University of Arizona? Arizona was, was a, a great experience in many ways, but it was also challenging. Um, I was going from a Christian worldview now to a completely secular worldview. And I knew that would happen intellectually and theoretically, but I didn't know exactly what it would be like in, in the context. And I remember my first class, one of my first classes that fall semester, the professor got up at the very beginning of class and he said, I know many of you are coming out of synagogues and churches and many of you are here for the first time at a state university and you've learned about the Bible in a certain way in a certain perspective he said but now you're at a state university and we're gonna we're gonna discover what really happened there were students that would leave that class crying because the rug of faith was being basically pulled out from under them and I basically made a daily decision to evaluate everything that I was learning on the basis of Scripture while it challenged my faith, it also helped my faith grow tremendously. I tell students today that I think I studied twice as hard as other students did because I not only had to learn the material I was learning, but I had to study how this lined up with, with what, what I knew and what I understood from a biblical perspective. You know, I didn't have answers for everything. I still don't have answers for everything. This is one of the, the delights of further investigation and, and further um, scientific inquiry. As I've studied other world religions, the Bible is unique in two specific ways. It's a collection of books that is constituted in history. I don't know of any other religious, major religious book or a collection of books out there that has that major focus and focal point. It's really the only book that you can go to scientifically and evaluate based on the historical evidence that is out there. What makes it so fascinating to me in my faith is that I can go to an ancient site, I can handle the actual material, whether those are pots, um, whether those are inscriptions, whether those are seals or, or stamps of seals, it makes it three-dimensional. And in that way, it's not simply a philosophical, esoteric idea that is somewhat abstract that you wonder about. Archaeology, what it does is that it makes what we read about in the Bible tangible and real. And, and for the first time, it's not simply 
a city that you mispronounce and you have no idea where it exists and how it how it relates to the wider picture of the Bible when you're reading a biblical story. Now you've been to that city, you've excavated that city, you've found the houses of the people that live in that city, and you've been able to to reconstruct in a sense what their life might have been like. So archaeology in that sense puts a reality behind something that you've read about as stories over, over a course of, of years, if you've grown up as a Christian or if you've grown up in a, in a Jewish home. But now for the first time, there's something behind those stories. Lachish is an extremely important site as we look at its history and as we realize that there is city after city after city that is superimposed on top of each other from earlier Canaanite periods, we refer to it as the Middle Bronze Age and the Late Bronze Age. These are periods where the city is expanded and is a major fortification. It's a major city-state during that time period. Um, this is the time period of the patriarchs in terms of the biblical period. Later during the conquest, um, it is one of the cities that forms a coalition against Israel, which is invading under the leadership of Joshua. And in the famous story of Joshua and the sun standing still, the king of Lachish is one of those antagonists in that story. Uh, then it is not mentioned for about 200, 300 years until the time of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, who is said to refortify the city of Lachish. And it becomes a very important fortified royal city in Judah we would probably say the second most important city in Judah after Jerusalem. And we have evidence for that in a number of biblical passages. When Amaziah, the king of Judah, flees for his life from Jerusalem because of a coup attempt on his life, where does he go to? He goes to the site of Lachish, and the Bible tells us the people find him there, they kill him, and they take his back, body back to Jerusalem. When the invasions take place of Judah under Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, and then under Nebuchadnezzar again, what city is mentioned in those passages in Scripture before attacking Jerusalem. The penultimate city before attacking Jerusalem is Lachish. So the site is mentioned 23 times in the Old Testament. It's a major, major um, city in Judah, and it was a fortification that guarded one of the main access roads up to Jerusalem, up to the hill country. So if the Egyptian king coming from the south or the Babylonian and Assyrian kings coming from the north, or the Philistines coming from the west. Um, if, they, if any of them were going to make any attempt to attack Jerusalem, they would have to encounter Lachish first. One of the contributions to the fourth expedition of Lachish was to uh, accomplish what our original research goal was, and that was to actually excavate levels four and five. These are the levels that date to the time of the 9th and late 10th century BC. Uh, these are the levels that go back to the earliest part of the monarchy, at least as far as Lachish goes. And one of the big questions that was raised in the past, was there an extensive settlement at the site? We only have one passage in Chronicles mentioning that Rehoboam fortifies or builds walls around a series of cities, and Lachish is mentioned in that passage. But up to this point in time, none of the previous expeditions had found city walls dating to the time of Rehoboam. So one of the goals that we had was to go back to Lachish and to examine the fortification system and see what the sequence of walls there actually was. And we uh, accomplished that over this period of five years that we were working there. And um, in the last two seasons, we began to excavate a massive wall sandwiched between uh, the level six wall and the level three and four wall, we have now a level five wall with a wonderful floor extended to it with beautiful houses abutting this wall and with a number of important uh, olive pits that we were able to send in for dating to Oxford University. That has nailed down the date not only of the wall, but it has nailed down the possibility that it actually might have been there and then potentially, perhaps, could have even been built by Rehoboam. Becoming an archeologist is not a trivial undertaking. It takes years of education and experience 
But in the hands of an archaeologist, a piece of pottery like this, found in context and examined with the appropriate knowledge, becomes a window into the past. Archaeology is often filled with surprises, and one of the surprises that came in the season of 2014 was one of the most important discoveries, I think, that we made, particularly as it relates to the Bible. We were excavating a massive destruction from the time of Sennacherib, the Assyrian king. We know that the Assyrian king not only attacked the city of Lachish, but destroyed it based on previous expeditions and also based on his own records, which mention very clearly his campaign against Judah. The account is also described in three different books of the Bible, in Isaiah, in Kings, and Chronicles, in quite some detail. Lachish is specifically mentioned, although the major focus of the biblical account is on Jerusalem and God's deliverance of Jerusalem before the Assyrian king. Lachish is also shown in the palace of Sennacherib, and those reliefs show his attack with battering ram after battering ram going up against the city. And so as we're excavating this major destruction level and we're finding sling stones, dozens of them, and, and pieces of mail, Assyrian mail, and arrowheads, and all kinds of evidence for a massive destruction, in that destruction debris we find a little tiny dipper jugglet. This is a little measuring cup. And as we pick up that dipper jugglet, and my daughter was one of the individuals that was involved in that, which was kind of neat. As, as they were looking at this dipper jugglet and, and then carefully emptying its contents, we found a seal impression. We call it a bulla. And we immediately stopped what we were doing and we began sifting the material that was excavated around this object and we found two more. And then we sent all of the material off to Jerusalem for wet sifting, and they found another seal in the same material. So we have four seals probably coming out of the same dipper jugglet because they would place these seal impressions in there as kind of a return receipt or a proof that they received uh, the document that was sealed. And these tiny seal impressions are no larger than your your pinky fingernail or maybe one of your maybe your thumbnail and they show on them the name of the person who was sending a document to the site um, and we could read it in the field uh, it was that clear it was it was incredible and we know it says Eliakim the son of Yehuzarach or belonging to Eliakim the son of Yehuzarach uh, very important we have Eliakim mentioned in the Bible in several passages, but there is one Eliakim in particular that is mentioned in the time of Hezekiah, in the time of this destruction. And that Eliakim is the chief steward of the palace in Jerusalem. And here we have the evidence of a document sent by him to the second most important city of Lachish. We believe it may be the same Eliakim, although we cannot be 100% certain. Um, based on a number of, of aspects to the study that we have been conducting. Uh, and if this is the case, then it's the first time we've ever found evidence for Eliakim, the chief steward of Hezekiah's palace um, here at the site. And that provides a triangulation of names. We know that Sennacherib campaigned here. We have found his name in his own reliefs and in various contexts. We have Hezekiah mentioned by Sennacherib by name. We have a seal of Hezekiah's father, Ahaz, mentioning him by name. And now we have a person very high in the government of Judah, Eliakim, mentioned also by name. And that gets almost as good as reaching back and shaking somebody's hand. <laughs> I want to tell you, watching these archaeological discoveries, I am amazed and, and my faith is strengthening watching this. And when I see these archaeological discoveries that proves the Bible is true, I shout and jump on, yes, this is my Bible, yes, this is my Lord. Because, you know, uh, 
these stories and the names of the kings and cities were labeled as myths. They never existed, but they are discovering. In 2021, 20, there have been a lot of discoveries. You now, uh, Dr. Hessel mentioned about the discovery of bull, uh, and uh, I have that video also. It's amazing to watch that. And friends, we are living in the last days of the world's history. Amen. Believe each and every word of the scripture. They are true. They are true because every word of the scripture is breathed. I'm, I'm saying just like we were made, God made us alive because he breathed into our nostril breath of life. In the Bible, the Bible words are breath of life. So let us go to our Sabbath school classes. Let's have a word of praise. Kind, dear, loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for these videos that strengthen our faith. Thank you, dear Lord. And now as we separate for our classes, uh, be with us. Uh, whatever we learn and discuss in our classes, may go deep into our hearts to bring forth fruits in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Not sure which is the best spot to put this. Okay. All right, how is everyone? Do we have visitors here today? Yeah, okay. Awesome. You've been here before, right? Never. All right. Well, welcome. From Jellico, Tennessee. All right. Are there any other visitors today here? <laughs> and where are you visiting from? Huntsville, Alabama. Huntsville, Alabama. Boy, the South emptied out, huh? Okay, yeah. it's great. Good morning. All right. So this is a brand new quarter, and this is the first Fourth of July that Brian and I would have been in Dayton, Ohio. Probably ever. So we usually go to Brian's family's house for the fourth, but he's on call this weekend, and so here we are. But anyway, so how has everybody been doing? What's been going on in your lives? Um, requests for prayer, thanksgiving, stuff that I don't know about, that we need to pray for that's been happening in our congregation. 
over the last week or two? You guys are really quiet. Yes, Dr. Small. I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation we just saw. Yes. We accept the Bible as God's word by faith, but God knows that, that we have curiosity in our souls, yes. and he gives us the bonus of something else that helps that faith to be solid. Yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, God humors us, and that's nice. <laughs> yes. And I do. I, I have really been blessed by by the archaeology and so forth. And Brian told Michael once, I think you should just take a backhoe and just do it that way. That's kind of funny. <laughs> you have to use these little instruments to dig all that stuff out. It's pretty, pretty nice. They're doing a 20 by 20 pattern, and there's a whole mountain to look at. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, some people had the personalities for it, and others just simply don't. <laughs> so anyway, but it really is a blessing. Um, the, the, the strength of Adventism, it really is based in history, um, and the Bible is based in history and, and in prophecy, and that's, that's the truth. So we have those two things, those two forces, history and prophecy, really is what we look at. So that's really great. All right. Uh, no request for prayer or anything then, right? Everyone's good, everybody's fine. I know that there are probably some silent requests. But um, let us go ahead and we'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, uh, we're just grateful this wonderful sunny day that you've given us with very mild temperatures, in fact, and low humidity. And we just want to come to you with praise and with thanksgiving. Uh, so often we want to remember and complain. It doesn't get us anywhere. But uh, we know that you inhabit the praises of your people. And so this morning we want to come to you with praise and with thanksgiving. We don't want to take anything for granted. The very fact that we're here today speaks of how much you love us. And we're grateful for this congregation at Centerville and the wonderful fellowship that we have as a family studying in and praying together week by week. We're grateful for the visitors that are, vis are coming here from, uh, from Tennessee and Alabama, that they will have a wonderful time with us today, that they'll be blessed by having been here. We know that there are several silent requests, and we ask that you attend to each one. And as we open your word, Lord, I just ask for your presence to be with us, for your Holy Spirit to teach us, to instruct us, to guide us and to allow your word to settle into our hearts deeply. I pray for Jesus' sake, amen. All right, it's a new quarter, and um, everybody got a quarterly, right, I imagine? And the, uh, the theme of the quarter this week is rest in Christ. And if you looked at the initial um, pages that were written before they got into any of the particular lessons, uh, it, there's, it says, rest for the restless. That's sort of how it, it starts off. Um, and uh, do we need rest? We probably do, right? So we need rest. So that's what this whole quarter is devoted to. In fact, um, so t today's lesson, the very first lesson, is living in a 24-7 society. Living in a 24-7 society. What is a 24-7 society? Anybody? Does anybody resonate with this, living with a 24-7 society? Have you thought about that? Yes. coming at us constantly and not every temperament is the same or personality and some people have a very hard time disconnecting um, the watch that we wear many of you I don't know if so a lot of people wear this watch and uh, you get the news on your watch you get text messages on your watch you get emails on your watch and every time a little buzz goes off you want to look and see what is that is it something important or not um, the phone goes off. You can't even get through dinner, a meal with a family without that. And I, I want to actually encourage everybody 
uh, during family times and family meals, don't look at your phone. Uh, I think that's a, that would be a way to start in terms of rest. But that 24-7 society is very busy. Um, does anybody remember when we had what we called car phones? Does anybody know a car phone? Looking at the majority of you, you have no idea what I'm talking about. But that's when you had a bag that you can with the phone and you put it on, there's an antenna in your car and everything, and that's how you use the phone. There was no such thing as this uh, little device that you just stick in your bag and so forth and answer the phone at will. Nothing like that. So it was much freer. We had much more time. So I think that this is a, a very vital thing. Uh, the 24-7 society, I, I believe, has much that can destroy us. So uh, let's turn to the memory text that they gave us today. And it is found in Psalm 82, excuse me, Psalm 84, verse 2. So Psalm 84, verse 2. And, um, and I think this is the prayer that probably all of us have. It says, My soul longs, yes, even faint, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And um, I pray that that is how we all feel. Dr. Small, you had a comment? You know, at creation, God divided a day and night yes. to, to rest. I think we're told in the New Jerusalem, it says there will be no night there. Yeah. So there will be a 24-7 yes. society in a sense there. But up to a couple hundred years ago, you went to bed when it got dark and you got up when it got light. So yeah. there was enforced rest. In today's society with technology, we, we've completely destroyed night being a time of rest. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's right. Okay. So that's the, the memory text. Now, I had a thought as I was looking at the, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole uh, concept of the lesson this week, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But if you look at uh, John chapter 10, verse 10, and this was actually given in the beginning uh, notes, but John chapter 10, verse 10 uh, says that, the thief does not come except but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life, that you have it more abundantly. And when you begin to think about some of what's been going on in society, these devices that we have that we're so attached to, I believe that they indeed have come to steal and to kill and to destroy, to steal our peace, our calm, our rest, to destroy family relationships, when we should be having conversations instead we're looking at devices. And so I think that's a great, uh, great test that the thief does not come except but to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and they have it more abundantly. And then I thought about the story, uh, and by the way, just really quickly, if you have your Bible, just turn over there to John chapter 10, verse 10, because I saw something as I looked at this text, um, and I recognize that um, the headings, some of you have the headings in your Bible, it talks about Jesus, the true shepherd, and Jesus, the good shepherd. So that's really, uh, and that's kind of what they want us to get out of that particular text, as, as, the, as the Hoover you know, put together uh, the titles for the, for the headings for the various chapter divisions, wrote that, and I thought that was really uh, uh, very, very good. Um, all right. So by way of introduction a little bit, um, <laughs> I want to say that uh, some quarterlies are easy to digest, right? There's something specific you go through. For example, we had a lesson one time on the book of Galatians, another one on the book of Romans. You knew exactly where you're going and how you're going to get there, right? Kind of an exegetical study. Really nice and easy to do. Last quarter, we studied the covenants, which I felt was some powerful material on the covenants. Very easy. Um, lessons like this, Rest in Christ, are more difficult to access. I'll use that word. And by that I mean uh, some of the texts will be used multiple times. I scan through the quarterly. Some of the texts I use multiple times. And you could go a million different directions with these various texts. And so um, I believe, and it has been my habit, you know that I don't go through day by day. I, I don't plan to ever do that. Um, I hope that everybody's been studying, come together with your ideas, 
And I think that my job as a the te as teacher is to kind of distill what the what the intent of the, the quarterly really is, and hopefully take a little bit deeper dive. For example, last quarter, the authors of the lesson had points at the bottom that we were to cover. Did you guys remember that? There were points at the bottom of each day that you know you're supposed to go there, you're supposed to cover these kinds of things. This, this quarter, those things don't exist. So every quarterly is kind of written a little differently. So what I want to do, first of all, I just wanted to highlight just what the days are speaking about, and then I want to look at one thing that was uh, in the lesson and then have three points that we're going to be, be looking at. So the first day <clears throat> is worn and weary. And we'll be talking about this lesson on Sunday quite a bit. What was interesting is the lesson title is worn and weary. However, it's from Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, and they were not worn and weary. So I wasn't sure where the title of that lesson that that day came from. Nevertheless, that's the title. And then Monday we have Running on Empty, and they had a story up there of Baruch, um, who had some issues. And then Defining Rest in the Old Testament, two days of Defining Rest, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. And then speaking about uh, a restless wanderer that came from um, that particular ver verbiage, came from one of the translations of the Bible, and is speaking about Cain. So what I think we'll do to begin with, as we're speaking about rest, we kind of want to have some kind of a common frame of reference for what is being spoken of. And if you look at Tuesday and Wednesday, speaking about defining rest in the Old Testament, there are some words that they mention there, and um, we'll look at them just briefly. So first of all, there are three points that I think we should cover today. One of them is, Rest is a very broad term, has many meanings. Okay, that's the first thing. Secondly, rest was and still is a part of God's plan for humanity. It was part of his plan for humanity. And then lastly, um, no true rest is found apart from Christ. So those are kind of the three broad things is that, thinking about the lesson, those are kind of the three broad things that we can cover. So first of all, rest, um, is a broad term that has many meanings. So if you look then at, at Tuesday and Wednesday, there are many words for rest. I actually looked this up in the several uh, concordances. I looked in, in Strong's concordance and in Young's and other things, and I thought to myself, there's a whole lot of words related to rest. Uh, the quarterly highlighted a few, I think about six different terms on Tuesday, the Old Testament, and then it went to the New Testament. So for example, Shabbat, which we all know about, and that's in Genesis chapter two and, and three, and that is speaking about God's rest. He rested from all his work. But added to that in the fourth commandment, the word nuach, and that's in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11, and Deuteronomy, when he's talking about the, about the 10 commandments that God rested. And there's some other words I've never heard of, uh, has anybody heard of that one word in the middle of the page there, shakat? And some of these things I'm going to say incorrectly. Shakat, that's in Joshua, and it basically means peace. The land was at peace, there was no war. That's what that one is. And then there's another verb, raga, and that is um, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 65. And that was a warning against disobedience, and the fact that if, you would, if the Israel was disobedient, they would go into captivity and exile, and they would have no peace, no rest. And so that's what that word is. Um, and then there's another word, and that's shakab, and that's lying down to sleep. So the Old Testament has this, and there, trust me, I looked this up, there are a whole lot more words than these in the Old Testament dealing with, with rest. And the New Testament, and that's all I'm going to say about that. In the New Testament, there are several words for, for rest, none of which I can pronounce that they gave us in the quarterly. And, uh, but one word is what we're going to focus on, really. So rest, the first rest there's in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Briefly, we'll speak about that. But then in Hebrews, I was very intrigued by the word in Hebrews. And uh, the quarterly gives us Hebrews chapter 4. We'll spend some time in Hebrews chapter 4 today. And the word is katapau, something like that. And that's the quality of rest of creation. Um, so those are kind of the words that are used. So the first thing then is that rest 
is a broad term and there are many meanings. And we want to get at some of the meanings that Jesus was talking about. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Excuse me, Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Genesis chapter 2, and we'll look at verses 1 to 3. And what we want to try to get at here is what is the, ki- what is the rest that is being spoken of in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. So, thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. All right. So, what's the rest that's being spoken of in this section? Yes, Scott. It's the cessation from worship. So it's like job well done, the garden's planted, I'm taking a break. Right? Yeah. This means we die. Okay. This means that this is done, and I'm okay. taking a breather. All right. So, so this is a job well done, here. it's done, you can rest. And actually, in this, in Genesis here, the word is Shabbat for rest in this particular word is is Shabbat, okay. So it's interesting because, you know, God worked for six days. He did a good job, he did a perfect job. He could have said, okay, let's begin day one again, couldn't he? But instead he made a seventh day. That's rather strange, right? Which means somehow he thought that was important for humanity, that he have a seventh day. And that day is a special day. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So what I perceive, not only do we see some work, but we, we're celebrating something. Okay. God is celebrating is the creation of man and the creation of the world, and I imagine all of heaven was celebrating at that time. Okay. I like that. So he said that this is like a holiday. This is also, the work is done, but it's also a celebration. And I like that. All of heaven, he said, was also was celebrating at this time. So what we see then so far is a day of it's all been done, rest, and also it's a day of celebration, right? Okay. So uh, very good. Um, there is a text that I wanted to look at in terms of what's all entailed in this particular rest. And I want to look at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. And uh, these are some awesome verses. So first of all, when, what, what, we, what we recognize is that God, when he was done with this perfect work, he did not need to rest. And this next text that we're going to read will show us that God did not need to rest. Okay, so let's just read through here. And they will say then, so what is it that he wants us to, to know about his creation and his creative work. What is he trying to get across? So let's begin here in Isaiah chapter 40 and just look at, um, I'll begin with verse 25 because I love that verse so much. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. Now I want you to really pay good attention to this. This passage is so rich. What is it trying to tell us about God? It's pointing us to the Creator. It asks us to lift up our eyes on high and see who's created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. By the greatness of His might and the strength of His power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? All right, let me just stop right there. Okay, so if I said to you, I showed you, you know, the Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, now we're looking at this. What lessons can we learn so far from this text? If you sat down with your Bible and you're going to ask the Lord, it's just you and him together, what is it 
he wants you to appreciate about these texts, these verses. I'm really big on that. I want you to get down with the word and know what it means. So what does it mean? I think it's his creative power. Okay, it's his creative power. Okay, very good. All right. Anybody else? There's none like him. <laughs> Scott. You're not going to surprise me. You're not going to surprise him. Everything has a name. All right. Anybody else? Yes. He's not tired. Okay. He doesn't get tired. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Yes, Deb. Debbie, I can't hear very good. Oh. Um. idea that we're, we're discussing rest and its definitions as a micro rest. God is saying the defense will rest. Yes. He is on trial and the defense will rest and sin will be no more. Okay. So you can believe that. All right. Okay. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much. All right. Has anybody been through the experience? So, so, so first of all, um, Isaiah wants to draw our attention to God. He says, lift up your eyes on high from all your little stuff that's going on. Lift up your eyes on high. And he wants to draw attention to two things. And I'll tell you why that is. So first of all, he says, lift up your eyes on high and see who's created these things. And he says, there's this host, right? There's no number to it. A host, he says. And he says, of this host, he calls them all by name. These are inanimate planets that can't respond to him. And he calls out their host by number. He calls them all by name. Somebody mentioned that? By name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of these is missing. Okay, that's a significant verse. Then he says, why do you say, oh, Jacob? He's speaking to these now people here and say, oh, oh Israel, say, oh, my way is hidden from the Lord and my just claim is passed over by my God. Maybe you guys sound as human as I am. Have you guys ever felt, ever felt that I'm here all by myself? Stuff is happening. There's catastrophes going on and God does not see me. He has no clue what's going on with me. I'm so upset. Why is this happening to me? Has anybody ever felt like that besides me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So what this text is telling us is that the creator of the universe, all those planets and the host of heaven, they're called by name, not one is missing. And then he says to us, to me, why are you saying that my just claim, my cause is hidden from God? So the creator of the universe wants us to know that he cares about us individually. He didn't lose anything up there. He's not losing any of us either. So the creator of the universe, one thing that tells me that creation, if you think about creation, in fact, when he rested, he had just made Adam and Eve, and he had breathed face to face with Adam the breath of life. That was an intimate encounter, eye to eye with Adam. He goes, you know, I've not, I'm not ignoring you. i am not forgotten you. Trials are happening. But by the way, I've still got this. So that's a really comforting thing. That, so the, he wants us to direct ourselves to him, to recognize that, no, he's not passing over our case. He doesn't grow weary. There's no search of his understanding. And then he promises us something. As you look at that passage in Genesis chapter 2 and see all that happened at creation, we know this. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. He's going to give us what we need, at the time that we, we need it. So we recognize that we have a God who's created the host of heaven. He calls them all that by name. Not one of them is missing. Nothing that we can do or say can divert his attention from us. His eyes are honest. He knows what's happening. Even when we're in trouble, he knows what's happening. And he'll give us the strength that we need to get through everything. That's what this text is telling me personally. And so the creative, as you look at the creation story, that first creation, that rest that we have, we can rest knowing that God knows that we are present, that we are here. He's taking care of everything. We don't have to worry about anything. So I think that's the important part of what the creation story is all about. All right. 
So um, in terms of that part, that's the very first thing I want to talk about. Um, that at creation, when rest was made, he wants us to keep our eyes on him, and the rest is for us, not for him. He's invited us to join him in resting. Okay, so that's the first thing. Any other comments about that? Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, and what we've covered so far. Yes. Oh, sorry. Scott, and then... Praise the Lord. Absolutely. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. That's excellent. Okay, go ahead. Yes. As I was studying this week's lesson, it dawned on me that God made Adam and Eve perfectly, yet still God set the example by telling them that those perfect bodies needed rest. Absolutely. So much more so now. Yeah. We, over 6,000 years of sin, yeah. we need rest. Yes. And rest is not necessarily sleep, but from what I gathered, it could be change of activity, it could be time out, as we saw in this lesson. Okay, I'm going to that. Okay, okay, that's the very next point we're coming to, that Adam, they were perfect and they needed rest, and we also now, after 6,000 years of sin, even more, we need rest. Okay, so that's the next section. So the next, so the first thing was uh, rest is broad. Second thing is that, uh, that one rest is that rest is part of God's plan for humanity. And how do we know that? Well, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, someone, I think it was Dr. Small that mentioned in the beginning. Dr. Small, did you have your hand up? Okay. They mentioned in the beginning about, was well, somebody over here mentioned about night. Um, he made night and he made day. So two things God did. First of all, he did something that was daily, a daily rest, which is night. We need night. And by the way, for those who say, I'm a night owl, I hate mornings, guess what? God made day people. You're supposed to sleep at night, not be a night owl. That's what the Bible says. He made night for sleeping. I, have a, I had a, a, my dear friend, when I was in medical school, I had a dear friend and and we were all medical students together, I laughed because she, we had some great times. I mean, she was crazy as I was crazy. And uh, her dad gave us several bits of advice all the time. One bit of advice he gave us, which I know I have experienced, it's true. Get two hours of sleep before midnight. Right. You'll feel much better in the morning. So two hours before, that means 10 o'clock you should be already in bed not getting ready for bed. Now I'm speaking to myself because I find myself too often getting ready for bed at 10 o'clock or 10.15. You gotta get into bed with two hours before midnight. And that's a really important thing. Why, did, why do so many people drink coffee? I've never even tasted coffee. Why do you get sick? Because they can't wake up and stay awake in the morning. Two hours before midnight, really. So God has given us a daily, in the Bible, God has given us this daily rest, which he has specified. He made the day and he made the night. Now, it is true that in heaven there'll be no night. And I'm glad about that because I don't like to sleep. I love to be awake. Can't you tell that by my personality? I love to be awake. I can't stand to sleep. But right now on this earth, he knew that we would need, need good rest daily. Secondly, he gave us a weekly rest, which is the Sabbath. And we're going to come to that, what, is, what that really means. But he gave us the Sabbath because he knew that we would need to know him intimately. The text we just read in Isaiah chapter 40, to me, is one of the dearest passages in the scripture. And you know, I have so many of those in, in passages in the Bible. People begin to laugh at me, think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. This is an incredible passage. To look up to heaven, to the God of heaven, and know that he cares about me is really a profound thing. So um, throughout history, from the beginning of time until the present still, rest was designed by God. 
He gave us a daily cycle of rest, which we need to honor. And he gave, you, gave us a weekly cycle of rest, which is also for our benefit, to lift up our eyes on high on, and contemplate who he is as creator and now as redeemer. So that's a really important thing. Anyone else have a comment on that? Yes, Debbie. not allowing any rest, which yeah. should disintegrate your mental process. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Very good. All right. So, uh, let, oh, I just got to get to a couple of texts here. Um, for example, let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I was going to go to skip this, but we need to do it. Matthew chapter 6, and, and uh, then we'll cover the last topic. Matthew chapter 6, verse 30 and 32. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 30 and 32, is that right? Excuse me, Mark chapter 6, Mark, the gospel of Mark chapter 6, verse 30 to 32. So the disciples had just been on their first missionary journey. They started two by two and they were so excited and came back to tell Jesus everything they had done. And in Matthew chapter, Mark, Mark chapter 6, verse 30, then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. Mm -hmm. Now there's something interesting about this verse that some of you I'm sure know, and that is this. Between the baptism of Jesus and the triumphal entry, so far as the events that occurred in Jesus' earthly life, between those two things is baptism and the triumphal entry. This is the end of his ministry now, right? That's Passover week. So in the, in the middle of those events, all of his life, as you look through the four Gospels, this event here of the telling them to come apart and rest a while and the feeding of the 5,000s, those two events are the only events recorded in all of the four Gospels. Not that interesting? Well, why is that so interesting? Why is that interesting? I thought, wow, this is interesting. I think I'd have, you know, Lazarus or something in all the four Gospels or something really big. But come apart and rest a while in all four Gospels? That's rather odd. And so I said to myself, it must be really important to, to, to Jesus that we come apart and rest a while. And all four Gospels record for our benefit that Jesus said, I don't care what you're doing, ministry even, ministry, come apart and rest a while. That's really important. Well, it rejuvenates the body. It does rejuvenate the body. We can't just keep, keep going. Keep going all the time. Absolutely. So rest is good. All right. And by the way, the quarterly made an interesting comment that this rest that we are to also have uh, to enjoy the, the gift of grass. Has anybody enjoyed the gift of grass? How about the gift of air? How about wildlife? My answer to the wildlife is it all depends. Those of you who know me know what that means. There are some wildlife that were not created in the beginning, as the Bible says. They came about by somehow, I'm not sure. The gift of water, the gift of people. So we are to celebrate, as someone said, celebrate, holiday, yes, yeah, celebrate, all these things, grass. In other words, we have to put ourselves on the mundane things of life, things that we ignore, that we don't ask or tell God thanks for and praise Him for. We get to celebrate those things on the Sabbath day. It's really important. Okay. So enough of that. Oh, uh, shoot. This is not going to go well. But the last idea is no true rest apart from Christ. Um, in the interest of time, let's go quickly to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Yes. I'm really hoping you're going to answer the question that's been pulling through my mind this okay. week. So the rest and the Sabbath. Yes. I don't see anything mentioned in this week's lesson about how it's supposed to do something to us. It uses that word of sanctify. We're going there right now. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So there, there are two things we need to get to. 
One of them is what I think is so important, Hebrews chapter 4. And then, and that's the rest. And that word that's used in Hebrews is unique to Hebrews chapter 4. Really important. And then Cain. We want to get to Cain. What happened with Cain? Okay, so Hebrews chapter 4. Let me, let me, just, let me just, just read this, and that way we'll get there quickly. Verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest. This is not my rest. This is his rest. Let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Don't come short of his rest is what the text is saying. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Um, for, we have, for we who have believed do enter that rest. And then I'm going to skip down to verse 4. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested, that's Shabbat, on the seventh day from all his works. Let's go to verse 9. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself ceased from his works as God did from his. Okay, I wish we had another hour to discuss this verse. So it says, this verse says, for he who has entered his rest, that's God's rest, he who has entered God's rest has ceased from his works as God did from his. I hope your minds are just really super excited at this text, uh, recognizing this. Let me just outline this very quickly and just in interest of time. First of all, unfortunately, chapter 3 and 4 are a unit. So chapter 3 and 4, it's a unit, and there's a line of reasoning that's going through this, these two chapters. So first of all, uh, God's original intent was to lead Moses and Israel into Canaan, that particular rest. Um, but the rest he really wanted was a spiritual rest for them. Unbelief prevented them from ending up in this rest. And then Joshua was able to take, take that next generation into Canaan. However, those people never entered into God's rest, that spiritual rest. The promise was made again to... Um, to David, but God's people have not yet entered into his rest. And that's still a promise that, that remains. What is God's spiritual rest? What's being referred to? God's spiritual rest. What is that? What's the real rest that we need? Rest from sin. <laughs> okay, rest from sin. Don't we need rest from sin? Yeah. We do. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, Joe. Resting in his grace and mercy on what he's done for us. Is that not where we, I think in America, we need less sleep and more rest. Yes. yes. Because it takes less sleep in order to receive the true rest, and that is the spending the quiet time that many of us struggle with. We might prefer to sleep instead of actually granting ourselves through meditation and prayer and study to find the true rest that only comes by recognizing ourselves being in Christ. I think that's where you're headed. Absolutely. So very quickly, and, and Joe has really nailed it. Joe, Joe has identified a, the, the issue, I believe. And I figured, as I read through the quarterly, the, quarterly, the lesson for, for the day, I said, they didn't even mention this, but it's important to me. So I just wanted to, and since they mentioned Hebrews 4, I said, I can go anywhere I want with this text. So God's spiritual, that's five minutes, God's spiritual rest is rest for the soul. There's no question that although sin is an issue, we need reassurance that God is the one who will do something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. So God's primary interest for his people is what we experience soul rest. And that soul rest really has to do with recognizing that the same God that had the power to speak the world into existence has the power to sanctify and redeem us wholly. And he's the one who's going to do it. The story of creation tells us that. And I do believe 
that there will be a generation who takes God seriously, who enters into this rest, allowing him to do in us what he promised he will do. We know it's the truth because creation tells us it is the truth. I want to point you guys, have, has anybody heard of Lessons on Faith? That book, Lessons on Faith by uh, Wagner and Jones. Um, it's a great book. The chapter in there in Creation or Evolution, and that chapter is life-changing. God is the one who takes the responsibility to create in us and recreate his image in us, and he will do it completely. So what is the rest in the soul? It means oneness with God, a complete dedication of the whole being with him, every obstacle to perfect communion with him removed, the entire sanctification, yielding ourselves to him, sinking into God. The experience of the Sabbath allows us to recognize, it shows that we have the faith to believe in the mercy and the grace of God to do in us his work completely and perfectly. And only he can do it. We can try and decide, I'm, I'm not gonna do this anymore, I'm gonna believe this, that's not gonna happen. But as we surrender ourselves to him by faith, allowing him to work in us, we'll be amazed at what happens. And also, I just wanna to read to the end here and then we're gonna to get to Cain in uh, two seconds. So. If you look down in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, these verses are important in the sanctification process. I'll read them quickly. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. When we have doubts about, about God's goodness, His grace, His mercy towards us, it says, we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Isn't that a wonderful text? So when we, as we go through Hebrews chapter 4, we see that God has promised there is going to be a rest. He's invited us to have free access to him and everything he wants to give us. Ask us to come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace at the time of our need. Very quickly, what happened with Cain? So Cain didn't accept what God could do for him. The sacrifice was an acknowledgement that through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, something good would happen to Cain and Abel and all of humanity. And there was a spirit of rebellion in Cain's heart. He wanted to do it his way. You know something? You can try your works all you want. It's just not going to work. You can think you're going to do it yourself. It's not going to work. And that was the problem. So Cain rejected the gift of God's goodness, the gift of his grace, the gift of his mercy, the gift of the cross. He rejected it. And that's the reason Cain ended up being a wanderer. Now, an important text. It's in uh, Genesis chapter 4. I'll read here really quickly, and I'll read what the RSV says, which is consistent with the, with the LXX and the uh, Vulgate and so forth. It says down there, Cain is beginning to complain to God about the punishment. And down in verse 14 of Genesis chapter 4, it says this, Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. He, Cain is talking to God. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him. Now in our Bibles, unless somebody has the RSV. Anybody have the RSV in here? The Revised Standard Version. The Revised Standard Version, which is consistent with the Syriac um, translation and um, the Vulgate and also the LXX, it says, God said to him, not so. Isn't that amazing? Cain is saying, God, you know, I'm so scared of death. I'm going to be a vulnerable man. I'm, it's, it's terrible. My life is over. I'm, I'm hidden from your face. And God said to him, not so. God is really good. Now, it did not mean that Cain's going to be saved or anything like that he would be left to live out his life and see all his descendants, what all happened to his descendants. But right then, Cain needed the reassurance that God was not going to be angry with him and seek vengeance on him. Cain said, I'm hidden from your face. Everything's going to happen bad. And God said, not so. And with us, he does the same thing. We can think all we want about God. He says, not so. It's up to us to determine if by faith we will enter into the work that he has in store for us. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you know we need rest. Thank you for giving us this weekly rest that we need. 
And the ultimate rest we do need is the sole rest that you have offered us. We're grateful, Lord, that we can come before your throne boldly, the throne of grace, and we can obtain mercy to help us in the time of our great need. And Father, when the enemy tempts us to think that you don't love us, that you have forsaken us, you want to tell us, not so. Father, I pray today that we will cling to you, come close to you, and even celebrate today the small things of life that you've given us. For Jesus' sake, amen.